Good afternoon. My name is Meg Satterthwaite, and I'm one of the faculty directors of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice here at NYU. And I'd like to welcome you to this event on protecting children in conflict. We're really pleased to host the global launch of the findings of the legal panel commissioned by the Inquiry on Protecting Children in Conflict. This is the first public occasion where the findings will actually be discussed. And that handout that you've been given is technically the first publication of the findings. The inquiry is chaired by education expert and former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who convened a legal panel staffed by renowned legal experts and headed by Shahid Fatima QC. The panel was directed by Andrew Hilland and review, the, the findings were reviewed by consultants Professor Harold Coe and Professor Dame Carolyn Hamilton. And we have all but one of those people I just met here with us to talk about the findings. The inquiry's task, there's perhaps no more visible example of the toll of conflict on children than what we saw earlier this week. A brazen attack on Duma, where the images of children suffering the effects what appear to have been a chlorine and sarin-like nerve gas attack. The attack and others like it, as well as the recruitment of children, attacks against schools, sexual assault of children, the abduction and trafficking of children, and the denial of humanitarian access to children in need, happen so frequently in our world that there is a true crisis. This crisis is often compounded by compassion fatigue. In this context, the inquiry convened a legal panel to ask the question, can law help in this context? What can law do? Specifically, the, the panel was asked to assess the effectiveness of the existing legal and accountability mechanisms to identify potential gaps in law and implementation and of course in enforcement and to formulate proposals for concrete improvement. NYU Law and the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice present this event with great pride, not only because it addresses a very pressing issue, but also because two of our faculty directors have been crucially involved in children's rights and would like me to say that they're very sorry they can't be here. That's Ryan Goodman and Philip Alston, who's currently on mission in Ghana. I'd like to extend my gratitude to our co-sponsors, the Just Security blog and NYU's International Law Society, and to thank the Catalyst Foundation for International Education for making this event possible. I'm going to introduce the panelists who will each um, speak for a little bit and present the findings, the context, the findings, and some of the legal implications. And then we'll have a moderated discussion with questions from you all. I'd like to just make one note, which is that we are recording this and it will be streamed on the web. Um, so if you ask a question, just be aware of that in advance. So the first panelist perhaps needs no introduction former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who's the chair of the Inquiry on Protecting Children in Conflict. He's an advocate for global action to ensure education for all, and he's served as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for Global Education since July 2012. In this role, he works with partners to help galvanize support for the UN Sustainable Goal 4, which is to achieve quality, relevance, and inclusive education and learning for every child. He was, of course, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 2007 to 2010, Chancellor of the Exchequer from 1997 to 2007, and before that, a Member of Parliament. He was the inaugural Distinguished Global Leader in Residence at NYU. And he has a PhD in History from the University of Edinburgh. After the Prime Minister speaks, Shahid Fatima QC will speak. She is the legal panel head of the inquiry. She's a London-based barrister at Blackstone Chambers. Her practice includes human rights, public international law, commercial and regulatory law. She's had some extremely prominent cases and is well known for representing states, multinational corporations, international organizations, NGOs, and government departments. She's appeared before English courts, the European Court of Human Rights, UN treaty bodies, and arbitral tribunals. She's also a founding editor of the Just Security blog. She was a global professor of law here at NYU in 2012, and she brings with her 
an LLB from the University of Glasgow, a university degree from Oxford, and an LLM from Harvard. Next, we'll hear from Professor Harold Coe, who is, is a consultant to the inquiry. And he was, I'm sorry, he is the Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale, and a well-known um, term as well as the Dean at Yale Law School from 2004 to 2009. He also was the US State Department legal advisor during the Obama administration from 2009 to 2013. And he served as a US Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor from 1998 to 2001. He clerked for US Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman and is a widely known international law scholar, as well as having a, a really interesting history as a litigator on the front lines of human rights litigation. And finally, at the end of our um, session, we'll hear from Andrew Hilland, who's the director of the Inquiry on Protecting Children in Conflict an advisor to the International Commission on Financing Global Education Opportunity, director of research and secretary of the Global Citizenship Commission, and a former attorney at Freshfields. He studied law at Oxford and also here at NYU, where he did his LLM. I'll now turn the floor over to the Prime Minister. Can I say, first of all, what a real pleasure it is to be back at uh, New York University and to say that what we're discussing today, at a time when there are 30 million children displaced from their homes, 10 million children who are refugees, exiled from the country, 75 million children who are in zones of conflict around the world, there can be no more important issue to address when we look at human rights than the tragic position faced by so many children who are trapped in conflicts. And so I'm very pleased uh, to be here uh, to be able to introduce this discussion, but I am simply the warm-up speaker uh, because the person who has done uh, the work that has made this report possible uh, is uh, Shahid Fatima, who is a brilliant QC, uh, a wonderful human rights uh, lawyer, and who has done, because I have had the privilege of reading it before we've had this session, a wonderful report. And I also want to thank Isabel, Yana, and Hanif, who are here today, who have been major contributors uh, to this report, and of course, Harold and Andrew, who are going to be part of the panel uh, today. And I want to give a special thanks to the person who, in many ways, was the inspiration for us doing this, and this is John Sexton, your president emeritus of New York University, whose foundation catalyst uh, is very much responsible for this event happening today, as well as the New York faculty, University Faculty of Law. And I want to thank him for what he has done over many years to promote uh, the cause of children and, and young people. Now, I was once, uh, as you probably heard, a, a, a university lecturer. And I know that universities stand for objectivity, impartiality, rationality, the pursuit of truth, the search for knowledge, and these were all the qualities I had to leave behind when I went into politics. <laughs> but I know in particular that New York University has a very special role in the firmament of universities. This is the first global network university uh, with campuses and points of entry in different parts of the world, unlike almost every other university in the world. A tremendous success story, one that is uh, growing in strength, one that is an inspiration for other universities. And therefore, when we're dealing with this global problem of the position of children in every continent who are facing uh, problems because of conflict, uh, there is no better university for this uh, exercise to take place than New York University, which is hosting this event today. And it's because of New York University also that um, Shahid uh, and I uh, managed to meet uh, to be able to start this project. Uh, I was invited by your faculty of law, Trevor Morrison, I'm grateful to him to visit the summer school in, in, uh, that was being held in, in Barcelona. Uh, John was uh, also uh, there. And it was a most enjoyable occasion and I spoke on some of these issues relating to education and conflict. And at the end of it, Shahid, uh, who was also present, uh, volunteered uh, to do uh, work in this uh, area. Uh, and uh, it was not long before I was calling on her for help, help which she uh, very kindly has provided. And if I give you the 
first instance of what we were looking at, you will understand uh, maybe the nature of the problem we're having to deal with. Uh, when uh, the Syrian bombings were at their height, Idlib, which is a community in, in Syria, was bombed. It was a school and college there within the precincts, targeted by planes, uh, 40 uh, children and staff killed as a result of this. And I kept asking myself, where in international law can we bring those people who have perpetrated this huge injustice uh, to book? Uh, what procedures can we do other than issue statements of uh, disgust and anger when you have a blatant example of a school which is supposed to be a protected facility, uh, understood in international law to be something that should be safeguarded, and then suddenly planes descend, uh, bombs are, are sent down, and children within their classrooms and the staff, the teachers themselves, are bombed uh, to death. And so I asked Shahid to, to look at this issue. And, and of course, it was impossible under the International Criminal Court for action to be taken unless you were a signatory to the International Criminal Court or unless, which has proved to be impossible, now on six occasions in relation to Syria, for the Security Council to agree to take action. The veto has been used on six occasions and most likely will be used again. So where could we go to find uh, justice uh, for the families of these uh, children? And Shahid um, looked at it and she came up with what I thought was a, a brilliant initiative uh, that if we could have pulled it off, perhaps could have made a difference to the way things are being done at the moment. Because of course, Russian and Syrian planes were involved in this. And if we could not find uh, justice uh, through the use of the International Criminal Court, uh, would human rights law help us? International human rights law help us? And Shahid looked at this and came to me and said, look, under the European Convention of Human Rights, to which Russia is a signatory, uh, the International Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, could take action. And of course, we tried to persuade a number of organizations to take action in this, in this area, but it proved impossible for us to get the unanimity that was necessary for action to be taken in a European court, despite the fact that the uh, bombing was in Syria, uh, under the aegis of the European court, action could have been taken if we'd had the political will, and I'll come back to that in a minute, to do so. And so here's an, an example of where an injustice needs a remedy, uh, where international law in other areas was defective uh, and where we were trying to find a device, uh, ironically, within Europe to deal with a problem in Syria. So it was clear to me that we had to find new ways uh, to bring justice where children in conflict are either being violated through this bombing or the school is being militarized or there is rape uh, against uh, girls. Uh, whatever, uh, and Shahid will instance uh, all the different issues that have come up with the violation of, of children in the last uh, year or two. So we then looked, at, can we find a way of looking at how children uh, are, are, are treated, particularly in conflict situations, uh, by the different strands uh, of, of, of international uh, law? Some of you may know the, the story of Olaf Palme, who was the Prime Minister of Sweden. Uh, he was Prime Minister in the 1970s when Ronald Reagan was President of the United States of America. And Olaf Palme wanted to persuade Ronald Reagan that we had to take action uh, to deal with the problems faced by children and young people in the poorest countries of the world. And he kept asking Ronald Reagan for a meeting in the White House and said he would come across at any time to meet him. And finally, Ronald Reagan agreed uh, to meet uh, Olaf Palme, the, the Prime Minister of Sweden. And Olaf Palme arrives at the White House and President Reagan is being briefed by his officials. And of course, he was the Social Democrat uh, Prime Minister of uh, Sweden. And Reagan turns to his officials and said, isn't this man a communist? And his officials say, no, Mr. President, he's an anti-communist. And Ronald Reagan says, I don't care what kind of communist he is. And Olaf Palme came in to see Ronald Reagan, and he said, uh, Reagan said to him, the president said to him, are you the man who wants to abolish the rich? And Palme said, no, I'm the man who wants to abolish the poor 
I want every single child to have the chance to realize the potential. And it's this aspiration that lies behind the report that Shahid has done. She will explain to you in some uh, detail uh, her conclusions about where we can make changes and where we could secure, secure agreement. She will also explain, I know, that the challenge is reaching political agreement and finding the political will to do so, something that is sadly lacking in so many of the global institutions in which uh, we are involved uh, at, at the moment. But I just say to you, how much different would the world be today if what Shahid is about to recommend to you is introduced? Over these last few years, we've not just seen the tragedy of children pushed out of their homes, six million of them in Syria, uh, and left either on the streets uh, or to be refugees in other countries. Uh, we've seen the tragedy of the conflict in Yemen, which goes on to this day, and very few children are even able to go to school in Yemen, and they are at the heart of the conflict there. We've seen in the last few months how in uh, Bangladesh, there are thousands of refugees from Myanmar uh, who, if they return to Myanmar, uh, would face uh, persecution in one way or another, uh, and who are uh, living lives where they are denied the chance of education despite the good work of many international organizations. We are still dealing with the fallout from what happened in Afghanistan. And when I go to Africa, you could travel from north to south of the continent. South Sudan, which I've visited, uh, where there are only 400 girls in the whole of South Sudan, a population of 10 million people who are actually in uh, the uh, later years of secondary education in that country. A similar figure for London would be 1 million, and it's uh, sadly, it's a very few small number of children and girls who get to school. And then you know the fallout in Uganda, you know what's happening in the Central African Republic, you know what's now in the last few days been reported in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and you know therefore that unless we uh, can implement a report such as what Shahid is about to propose, uh, then children are left vulnerable and left uh, in, in, in a way that they cannot protect themselves. I want to end with what I think is a message of hope. This morning, I picked up a copy of the New York Times, and if anybody has read it or will read it, you will see there is a major feature on the girls of Nigeria who were kidnapped four years ago this week and who were abducted, taken uh, by Boko Haram, whose, whose name means in the language of the Nigerians, Western education is a sin. They, they do not want girls to be at school. And then some have died had been murdered, some have been raped, as we know, and some have had uh, children as a result of being uh, taken away. About a hundred uh, were released, uh, and many of them are now at um, university. And you'll see the story today of the girls explaining what happened to them and, and, and what kept them going uh, in the most difficult circumstances, many of them abducted for more than two, two years, in some cases three years. And what the last paragraph of the story says is one girl repeating what she had said to the interviewee, that what kept her going and what kept her classmates going was the messages that had come from across the world. They, for some reason, had managed to get hold of a radio. And the fact that there were so many people standing up for their human rights and standing up for their a case that they should be released uh, and that they were supporting these girls. That message did get through to the girls. And just as in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was a prisoner and messages came through to his prison that he had support out there and therefore he never lost hope, so too people like you standing up for these girls, explaining the case to the rest of the world, making sure that the case for human rights and their human rights was, was heard. Uh, made a huge difference, both to the morale of these girls and their determination uh, to one day be released. So never believe that what you do in support of uh, human rights is not being heard. Never believe uh, that what you're doing can't make a difference. Never believe uh, that in standing up for human rights, as Shahid is doing with this report today, you cannot begin to change the world. This is a very important report, and I'm privileged to be part of its introduction. Thank you very much.
hard act to follow. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here today, especially given how wonderfully sunny it is. And since it's a Friday afternoon, I do have a vague recollection of what it's like to be a student. And I commend all of you for turning up today. Um, my thanks also to the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice for hosting this event, to the Catalyst Foundation and John for making it possible, and to my fellow panelists for being here. And of course, um, a big thank you to Isabel Hanif and Yana, who are three of the nine individuals. The other six are in London, one is in Canada, who couldn't be here today. So thank you to all of you. I am going to summarize today the findings of the report that Gordon has described. I want to begin by making three preliminary points that I would urge you to hold in your mind as you're listening to what I have to say. The first is that when Gordon invited us to write this report, he wanted us to do an objective inquiry. There was no preordained conclusion. We had a blank piece of paper, and it was to be completely objective, and that's what we did. The second point is that it was to be a legal inquiry. It was to focus on the law, the substance of the law, the accountability mechanisms that exist, and again, that is what we have done. The third point, which brings together those two, is that what we've produced, some 600 pages of legal analysis and recommendations, has been presented without a political filter. So where we considered that there was a legally supportable recommendation, we have made it. We haven't assessed the recommendation for the prospects of political success. We haven't prejudged it. And that's an important point to make, and I want you to remember it. And the reason for that is that our document is not time sensitive. We aren't saying that these are recommendations or proposals which need to be achieved within a week, a month, a year. They are the proposals that we have thought are appropriate in light of the legal analysis that we have applied to the question of how the framework could be improved and how the accountability mechanisms could be improved if there was a political will to do so. And so we haven't ruled things out on the basis of our own personal preconceptions about the role of international law in today's political climate, and in particular, the retreat from multilateralism. I'm going to now move on to give you a bit of context about the legal history in this area, because it helps explain some of our findings, and it may provide those of you that are not familiar with children's rights with some of the background. Children have always been caught up in conflict. Think about David fighting Goliath, think about Joan of Arc, think about the children's crusades in 1212. But the impact of armed conflict on children increased dramatically at the start of the 20th century as there were changes and developments in the technology of warfare. Think about aerial bombardment. But not only was there a negative impact on children at the start of the 20th century, there was also a positive impact. Because at the same time, the law was beginning to recognize their special position and their vulnerability. The first Declaration on Children's Rights was drafted in 1923. The next year, it was adopted by the League of Nations General Assembly. And indeed, it's the first human rights instrument to be adopted by an intergovernmental institution. In 1939, Save the Children and the Red Cross drafted a convention for the protection of children in armed conflict. That wasn't taken further because of the outbreak of the Second World War. And it was only after the war had finished that the Bolivian Red Cross drafted their own convention on the protection of children in conflict. That didn't come to fruition either. And the reason for that is that a large amount of its content was used to inform the Fourth Geneva Convention on the Protection of Civilians. Now, two reasons were given at the time for there not being a specific convention protecting children. The first reason is that it was thought difficult to try to separate out the interests of children 
and the interests of civilians in general. And the second reason is it was thought to be unwise to push for a specific convention on children when at the same time they were pushing for conventions on prisoners of war and civilians in general. So 1949 saw the conclusion of the four Geneva Conventions. They deal with the wounded and sick of armed forces on land, the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked armed forces at sea, prisoners of war, and civilians in general. Now, the lack of a specific convention protecting children in 1949 has been criticized. It's been said that it fails to recognize the special needs of children in armed conflict and their special vulnerabilities. So you could say that the Fourth Geneva Convention left a gap in the law, and you could analyze the subsequent international law developments as being an attempt to try to fill that gap that was left in 1949. Many of those developments have been important, but none of them has sought comprehensively to tackle this issue. There is no single document today that you could go to to find out the protections that children have in armed conflict. And that's a point that I'm going to return to. But first of all, I want to just go back to the narrative of history and talk about what happened after 1949. There were numerous international law developments which protected children both directly and indirectly. They include the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Additional Protocols 1 and 2 to the Geneva Convention, and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Most notable is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. That is the most widely ratified treaty. It's universally ratified except for the United States. It has one provision which deals expressly with armed conflict, Article 38. It's questionable whether the rest of the very wide-ranging provisions apply to children in armed conflict, and if they do, the extent to which they do so. There are two substantive protocols to the CRC. The first one deals with the recruitment and use of children in armed conflict. The second deals with the sale of children, child prostitution, and pornography both adopted in 2000. There's also a third optional protocol called OP3, which is a protocol on a communications procedure. Where a state ratifies OP3, it's possible for a victim who has been subject to a violation to complain to a UN treaty body, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, about the violations. Only 37 states have ratified OP3, and again, that's a point that I will come back to. In 1992, the CRC committee recommended that an independent expert be appointed to consider the issue of children in armed conflict. The recommendation was taken up, Graca Michelle was appointed, and in 1996, she produced a seminal report looking at the issue of children in armed conflict. One of her recommendations was that an office be created, an office of the special representative of the Secretary General on children in armed conflict, and that recommendation was taken up the following year. Now, since 2005, the special representative has been engaged together with the Secretary General and the Security Council Working Group on monitoring, documenting, and reporting on violations of children's rights in armed conflict. It's called the MRM, the Monitoring and Reporting Mechanism. And it looks at violations by reference to six issues, the six grave violations. They are killing and maiming, the recruitment and use of children, sexual violence, child abduction, attacks on schools and hospitals, and denial of humanitarian access. Now, since 1996 and the Machal Report, there have been a number of further international developments. There have been treaties, the Rome Statute, the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. There have been other international instruments, the Paris Principles, the Safe Schools Declaration. And there have been international initiatives. Most notably, the NGO Geneva Call has a system called Deeds of Commitment, which encourages non-state 
armed actors to pledge to uphold humanitarian norms in the document and to publicly commit to do so. Now, all of these legal developments have been incremental and they've taken place whilst the nature of conflict has also changed and developed. So in the period that I've just described, interstate conflict has declined and instead there's been a rise in non-international armed conflict, often with an international element. That means that it's now more likely than ever before that battles take place in civilian areas. And it's more likely than ever before that terrorism has a role to play in those battles. Technology has also had a role to play whilst it can be used for positive purposes such as the identification of violations, it can and is used for propaganda and targeting civilians. So whatever the legal solution is, it's got to take into account that changing nature of conflict as well as the changing legal developments that I've just described. Now against that backdrop, I want to explain to you the scope and approach that we took to tackling this topic and what we've concluded. I want to say something about scope and approach because the issue of children in armed conflict is a huge one. And it's very difficult to pick and prioritize the topics that deserve attention over others. We have ring-fenced the six grave violations and considered them. And the reason for doing that is that they are obviously points on which there is international consensus as to their importance given that they are the basis for the monitoring and reporting mechanism which I've described. Of course, there are other pressing issues. The role of children as perpetrators of offenses, children as detainees, children as refugees. But as I say, we had to draw a line somewhere and we drew it around the six violations. We also had to consider which legal systems we were going to look at. The issues that we've discussed could be analyzed on an international, regional, or domestic level. We've chosen to focus on the international, and we look at each of the six grave violations in turn by reference to international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and international human rights law. Now, that is not to say that domestic law is unimportant, and we have been at pains throughout the report to emphasize the importance of domestic law because it is the domestic implementation and enforcement of international law that provides one of the best safeguards for accountability to be effective. The third point I want to make on this is that we've looked at not just the substantive legal standards but also the accountability mechanisms. And on that latter, there are again a whole range of mechanisms that we could have considered ranging from Security Council resolutions to the operation of the MRM in practice to various softer forms of accountability. But our focus has been, perhaps unsurprisingly as lawyers, on adjudicative accountability mechanisms. And the reason for that is that we consider that they provide one of the strongest forms of accountability, that is, the determination of rights and obligations by an independent and impartial tribunal established under the rule of law. So in terms of our conclusion and our recommendations, there is no doubt that in the 20 years or so that have passed since the Machal report, there's been a huge amount of work that's been done. The issue of children in armed conflict is firmly on the international agenda. There is a robust framework in place for monitoring and reporting on violations, and yet we still see and hear constantly news of children suffering in conflict zones around the world. And so something seems to not be working. And the question is, what is it legally that is not working? And what can we as lawyers suggest to try to fix or remedy or help in fixing and remedying the problem? Now, in relation to the first question, what legally is wrong? In a nutshell, 
our conclusion is that the substance of the protections in humanitarian law, criminal law, and human rights law are adequate. I'll come on to qualify that, but in general, the substance, the standards are adequate. The difficulty is twofold. The first is that it is difficult to identify and therefore to apply and comply with humanitarian law and human rights law. And the second issue is that there is an egregious lack of compliance and implementation and accountability across the whole of the international law regime. Now, what we have recommended are two layers. We have the basic recommendations and we have a supplementary recommendation. And I'm going to explain what both of those are. But let me introduce them by saying that the basic recommendations that we make do not attempt to tackle the systemic problems that I've just identified about the difficulties in identifying and applying humanitarian law and human rights law and dealing with the fundamental issues of lack of accountability. That is something that we've addressed in the supplementary recommendation. And so there are a range of options that could be acted upon depending on the political will and the response to this report, ranging from the relatively minor through to a systemic and quite dramatic uh, suggestion. So on our basic recommendations, as I said, in general, the substance of protections under the three international law regimes is generally adequate. However, we have identified areas where we consider that there is room for improvement even within those standards. And we've identified them by way of three categories. So first of all, we consider that there are vague or ambiguous existing standards that could be clarified. The second category is where the law at present is underdeveloped or sometimes the protections are non-existent and we've suggested that they be strengthened or developed. And the third category is where there are existing international instruments where we suggest that there is greater ratification in order to improve the substance of the protections that they provide. I'm going to just give you an example of each of those three categories as illustrations. So in relation to the first category, there is a rule of humanitarian law, which, and I'm generalizing, provides that children are entitled to special status, special respect in armed conflict. Now, that rule exists in three different sources of law, and each of those sources formulates the rule differently. So Article 77.1 of Additional Protocol 1, which applies in international armed conflict, and Article 4.3 of Additional Protocol 2, which applies in non-international armed conflict, overlap to some extent because they both say that children are entitled to certain care and aid. That's the phrase, that they should be given the care and aid they require. And both of those provisions go on to identify certain specific protections. But they do so in slightly different ways. And then there's a third source, which is a rule of customary international law in the study of those rules done by the Red Cross, which says that children are entitled to special respect and protection. Full stop, no examples. So you have three different sources, and it's very unclear whether they actually are purporting to cover the same protection, and it's very unclear what precisely the specific protections are that they are more generally describing. So what exactly is it that special respect and protection or care and aid entitles a child to in addition to the protections which they have in any event as a civilian? And so in respect of that, we have suggested that the law is standardized so that there is clarity. And we have suggested that there should be a list. It doesn't need to be exhaustive, but there should be a list which identifies at least some of the specific protections that children are entitled to as a result of their special status. An example from the second category, where we've identified areas where the law is underdeveloped or non-existent, is that at present, there is no existing obligation 
on the parties to conflict to agree specific measures such as a temporary ceasefire or a humanitarian corridor in order to provide children with humanitarian access. And we suggest that the law should be developed to create such an existing obligation, even if it did so to require them to use their best endeavors or some such language. An example of the third category of instruments which we suggest should benefit from greater ratification are the two substantive protocols of the CRC that I've already mentioned and additional protocols one and two. Now, all four of those instruments are already very widely ratified, but there is room for further and better ratification of them. And we suggest that that should be encouraged in order to create a stronger web of protections in this area. So those are our basic recommendations in relation to the substantive framework. Our basic recommendation in relation to accountability is that there should be greater ratification of OP3 and the Rome Statute. I've already described the limited ratification of OP3. The Rome Statute has been ratified by 123 states. So again, there's room for improvement. And what we suggest is that at least having that greater ratification means that there is an option for victims, for prosecutions. You would have the possibility of a complaint to the CRC committee and the possibility of prosecutions before the ICC if there were greater ratifications of those two instruments. So, so much for the basic recommendations. Our supplementary recommendation is that there should be a single instrument, a single international law instrument that contains the relevant international humanitarian law and international human rights law that applies to protect children in armed conflict. And that that instrument should give a single civil adjudicative body the competence to monitor the implementation of the norms in that instrument and to have jurisdiction to hear complaints which are brought about violations of that instrument. You will have noticed that I didn't say that international criminal law should be covered in that instrument and the reason for that is, in our opinion, the Rome Statute adequately captures criminal law and the ICC is an appropriate and adequate international criminal adjudicative body. So I want to just explain now why we say that the supplementary recommendation is needed and what the underlying problems are, and I've already touched on those. So the first critical problem that the supplementary recommendation is targeted towards addressing is the difficulty and complexity in identifying and applying human rights and humanitarian law in this context. And I want all of you to think about, all of the law students in the audience, to think about how you would go building a case if you were presented with one where a child had been uh, attacked or had a right, I want to leave it ambiguous, a right violated in armed conflict. You would have to start with humanitarian law and you would have to start by classifying the conflict in question. Is it an international armed conflict? Is it a non-international armed conflict? That is a very difficult question, both legally and factually. Once you've overcome that and established the nature of the conflict, you then have to consider what the relevant provisions are that actually apply, that prima facie apply. And for that exercise, you're going to have to go through multiple international instruments, the Fourth Geneva Convention, Additional Protocol 1, Additional Protocol 2, depending on the nature of the conflict. You are going to have to think about customary international law. Are there relevant rules? Do you want to use them? How do they interact with the treaty provisions that you've identified? And then you're going to have to think about international human rights law, especially if it provides greater protection, which incidentally, it doesn't always. But if it does provide greater protection, are you going to be able to invoke it in the context of armed conflict? Are there relevant derogations? Are there questions? about whether or not one or the other of the legal systems is a lex specialis. Throughout that whole analysis, you are going to be considering definitional difficulties, textual ambiguities in the provisions, and you're going to have to grapple with those. And so 
the process of identifying and applying either humanitarian law or human rights law in any given case involving a child in armed conflict is challenging. Now, you might at the end of that realize that actually it was a very lengthy procedure and it could have been shortcut because, for example, the treaty provision exists in customary international law and so you didn't need to be concerned about the source. Or there's a very similar humanitarian law norm as there is a human rights law norm, so you didn't need to be unduly concerned about which regime it was. But as you all know, you will only come to that conclusion after you've actually done that exercise. And it's that complexity and difficulty which is alienating and difficult for non-state armed actors and victims in particular. And so our suggestion of the single instrument, the purpose of that suggestion, is to make it easier to identify the law, which in turn should make it easier to explain and disseminate and hopefully to encourage compliance with the law. So the instrument would collect together the applicable norms, would codify where appropriate the customary international law norms, and could even attempt a consolidation exercise where similar norms exist in both humanitarian law and human rights law. The second systemic problem that I identified earlier was the lack of accountability. And the problem here is that there is no single civil adjudicative body that you can go to to complain about violations in relation to children in armed conflict. So as a victim, if you want to bring a case, you have to search amongst the panoply of existing international institutions to work out whether any of them has jurisdiction, whether or not you'd be able to bring a case before them. But not only is it difficult for victims to secure accountability when there isn't a single mechanism, it also makes it very difficult to have even and consistent domestic implementation and enforcement because there isn't a single entity that's responsible for that. And so again, our supplementary recommendation tries to meet that concern by having a systemic answer to a systemic problem. Now, we've thought about the form that this instrument could take, and one potential form would be as a fourth optional protocol to the CRC. Uh, one virtue of this is that it would make use of an existing body with obvious expertise. It would overcome the practical and political difficulties of starting a new institution from scratch. But of course, the CRC committee would likely need to be modified, for example, to bolster its humanitarian law expertise. It could be assisted in carrying out its amplified mandate by the special representative. We would anticipate that the instrument is open for ratification by states, but also, rather like Geneva calls deeds of commitment, that non-state armed groups are encouraged to pledge their acceptance of the norms in the document and also to accept the jurisdiction and competence of the CRC committee. States would have an additional obligation of implementation of the norms in the instrument as well. Now, of course, we are aware of the fact that the instrument would raise a range of conceptual and practical legal obstacles. For example, drafting a document which combines humanitarian law and human rights law, given the different objectives of those regimes, may raise certain challenges. But there is a precedent for it, which is the CRC itself, because it combines human rights provisions and humanitarian law. And we do not, as lawyers, think that the difficulties in drafting and seeing to fruition this document are likely to be insurmountable obstacles. Instead, we anticipate that it is likely to be political will or lack thereof, which may be an impediment or obstacle to our proposals being taken forward. However, as I said at the outset, that has not been something that we have prejudged.
Our report is going to be published soon. Um, you can judge whether or not you think that the recommendations which I've summarized today are worthy. And perhaps history will be the best witness of whether the proposals that we have made in this report are an instance of the pen and the rule of law proving that they can together be mightier than the sword. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's a great uh, privilege to be here and great to be back at NYU. Um, this inquiry is a tribute to the indomitability of spirit and drive of four people, Gordon Brown, uh, Andrew Hillard, Shahid Fatima, and John Sexton. John's indomitability is shown by the fact that he continues to wear a Red Sox, a, a Yankee cap uh, after the beatdown of his team uh, <laughs> over the last few days. And um, nevertheless, John will always uh, uh, come back. Um, his team might not, but John will always come back. <laughs> Um, I was asked to be a consultant to this project, uh, an un unpaid consultant, I might, <laughs> uh, which I thought was going to be quite a the unpaid um, easy exercise. Um, I was brought in by my friend Shahid Fatima, and by the way, for those of you who haven't seen it, th this is the report that will soon hit the streets. Um, I had no idea at the time uh, exactly what it would entail, but as you know, London is five hours ahead of New York City or New Haven, Connecticut, and for a period of about two weeks, every morning I'd wake up and there would be another <laughs> chapter from Shahid, which I would have to read and comment on before the next day, and I couldn't get behind because I knew another chapter <laughs> was coming in. She had um, corralled nine other incredibly talented uh, lawyers in um, the UK to put this together on incredibly short notice. And Shahid, as you've just seen, is a true uh, fourth force of nature. This is a project of passion and principle. And um, it is something that I think will make a huge contribution in this area. So uh, John deserves credit for having funded it, Andrew for having coordinated it, Shahid for having driven it to completion, and the Prime Minister for having commissioned it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, my advantage was one of perspective. As someone who was reading the entire thing very quickly, uh, I had the perspective of many who might come to this project asking three skeptical questions. Uh, one, do we really need another report? Two, uh, will it accomplish anything? And three, is there an obvious place to go from having the report completed? Um, and the answer to all these questions is yes, it is worth having this report. It will accomplish something and there is a place to go. And so I just wanted to address those three questions. First, uh, why do we need an international law inquiry into protecting children in conflict? Uh, children, ironically, are supposed to be the favorites of the law. Uh, they are placed in a special position of favoritism, but they suffer to an extraordinary extent. Uh, one, because of the severity of the harms that have been visited upon them, which the Prime Minister reviewed. Second, their extraordinary vulnerability. Third, the compassion fatigue, which uh, Meg Satterthwaite talked about. Fourth, the gaps in the legal structure which uh, Shahid talked about. Uh, and I think perhaps uh, most, uh, most horrifying of all, the, the astonishing brutality and cynicism of those who would victimize them. The fact that we have uh, in this world people who will kidnap children, use children, kill children, uh, and then kill the children who have just killed the other children and then recruit more children to carry this on to the next phase. This leads to the real possibility of a generation or multiple generations of trauma uh, 
uh, damaged individuals who can never survive, never contribute. Uh, and to see this at work for a human rights lawyer is devastating. Uh, when I was Assistant Secretary for Human Rights and would go to refugee camps, what I would often ask is, can I just see some of the children? And if you saw that the light had gone out in their eyes, you knew that they were finished. Uh, I saw this in North Korea, I saw this in Sierra Leone, I saw this in Bosnia. Uh, it takes a special kind of sustained and horrible brutality to kill the hope in the hearts of young children. And that's why uh, we need to address this problem with special care. So why does a report help? Because as Shahid mentioned, there are three regimes of law, international criminal law, human rights law, and humanitarian law. There are many institutions uh, who could simply put the responsibility off to one another. And because in theory, children are supposed to be focused upon by domestic law rather than international law. Um, <clears throat> and because it's unclear what the law of children in armed conflict actually looks like. And so the greatest strength of this entire exercise is to create a document for what we in the United States like to call one-stop shopping, a book where you can actually read everything there is to know, and it really is everything there is to know about uh, the bodies of law, the cases, the responses, and one-stop shopping with regard to a legal instrument that could address these issues. In other words, instead of the blind men looking at the elephant, we finally have a single document that tells you what the entire elephant looks like. And it pulls together six disparate kinds of problems. Killing and ill treatment of children, their recruitment and use in armed conflict, sexual violence against children in armed conflict, abduction of children, and then attacks on hospitals and schools, and denial of humanitarian access and assistance which has a disparate negative impact on children. Now, <laughs> the Michelle Report of 1996 was an extraordinarily important instrument. It came before the adoption of the Rome Statute, which is why, in particular, it was a good time to address this now. Um, and it was important to address it with a document that addressed children qua children, as opposed to children as civilians, children as soldiers, or the other categories in which they might occupy. Now, <clears throat> why then is such a report critically important going forward? You often hear from some on the right about what they call lawfare. In fact, there's a blog uh, named Lawfare. Somehow the notion that law is an impediment to fair and just outcomes. But in human rights law, there's a different kind of lawfare, lawfare, F-A-I-R. And what this book contributes is to that kind of lawfare. Law is an impetus to the achievement of fair outcomes and results. So what are those elements? Let's start with law. The capacity to crystallize and identify legal violations from a set of facts. And uh, if you have a situation where a child is held in a uh, refugee area during an armed conflict with no humanitarian access, being brutalized by sexual violence, being recruited into other kinds of activities, uh, instead of calling for an overarching horror, you can actually identify from this text and from the legal instrument that's being proposed the nature of the legal violations to which that individual is being subjected and why they are international legal obligations. That's law. What about FAIR, F? The need for a forum, a forum in which these legal violations can be brought. And what the uh, project does is it identifies the International Criminal Court and the uh, uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, as two possible forums that have a place for these kinds of claims and actions to be brought. And it further identifies adjudicative accountability mechanisms in all areas of the law as appropriate zones and areas for these actions to be, uh, to be contested 
and it identifies someone whose responsibility is to bring the cases to these forums, the Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict. A, <coughs> if F is forum, A is allies and adversaries. This is the first report that I have seen that specifically focuses on the role of armed groups as perpetrators of crimes against children. We've seen this with the Taliban, we've seen this with Boko Haram, we've seen it with the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, the main focus here is on who the adversaries are and how they can made to be bound by and held responsible even when they're engaged in non-international armed conflicts and the like. The next issue is I, F-A-I, issue linkages. Often the way to make human rights actionable is to make it someone's problem because it's linked to another issue. Uh, one idea being proposed here is for economic sanctions to be used as an issue linkage. Another is to link it to an armed group's desire for legitimacy. For example, the FARC in Colombia cannot gain respectability for international negotiations unless it has been uh, demonstrated to actually be meeting the standards that are required by this report. And finally, R, relief. The relief that can be requested under a lawfare approach are those forms of relief that are available under international criminal law, international human rights law, and international uh, humanitarian law. And what this document does is it suggests that brought into that frame, all three kinds of relief could be appropriate as long as the various uh, issues and violations that are considered are factored in um, to, the, uh, to the issue. Now, to get this onto the agenda of the various organizations and actors will take a huge amount of work. This is a beginning, it is not an ending. But what it requires is for all of us to be dogged and happy warriors. Uh, not to name drop, but let me do this please. <laughs> I met Nelson Mandela for two minutes in my life, um, but they were a very amazing two minutes to me. It was at the United Nations in 1990 uh, I'm sorry, the year 2000, he was coming to speak at the uh, Security Council, and uh, Richard Holbrook, our ambassador, brought him to the back room where everyone was in awe of Mandela. And to make small talk, Holbrook said, Mr. President, isn't it true that you were imprisoned for 27 years? And Mandela said, you know, sometimes I miss that time. I got a lot of reading done. <laughs> and the whole place exploded in laughter. But more than that, at that moment, you understood how he had survived for 27 years, that nothing phased him. He saw that things were a long haul and that he should carry this fight forward in every conceivable area until uh, victory was achieved. Uh, that is what I think we have here. Um, we have now finally uh, a crystallization of the problems and issues, the legal issues faced by children in armed conflict, a proposed legal instrument by which they can be addressed. Um, so legal violations that can be identified, forums uh, in which issues can be brought, adversaries who are clearly identified, issue linkages, which can be pursued and uh, mechanisms of relief that are now available to be invoked. And that is a beginning, and we must, uh, over a period of time, carry this forward. Uh, and I think this will be remembered in the long-term struggle uh, as a very important and seminal moment in that uh, continuing struggle. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all of the speakers. I think they've really um, explained an enormous work in a very short period and put it into a context that I think asks us all to respond.
So we're going to open the floor now for discussion. Um, if you could just raise your hand, and I'll keep a cue. And then just a note about these microphones. Once you're called on, if you can press the button to turn it on, and then when you're done, it's important that you turn it off. Otherwise, the other ones won't be as loud as they normally are. I invite any hands. Yes. Good afternoon, and thank you all for uh, that fantastic presentation and all of your important work. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the, um, the supplementary recommendation of creating a specific instrument tailored to this specific issue. My question relates to the fact that um, it was mentioned that these spe six particular areas of grave violation were fenced off for the purposes of this work, as well as an approach that focused on adjudicatory remedies rather than other forms of remedies and uh, compliance. Of course, the law itself and the issues have no such fences. Um, and what's more, there's a whole host of issues within both human rights and the law of armed conflict that extend beyond children or in fact are important to children, including uh, the treatment of their parents, including the fact, you know, if, um, if children are in a hospital, that hospital is of course also a hospital, so IHL has other protections for hospitals. So I guess my question, I would love to hear you address the fact that by bringing all the rules pertaining to protection of children from grave violations into a single document, how would you then deal with the issue of having an instrument that's pulled those issues away from the other issues and context which surrounds them in their current instruments and documents? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think there was a substantive element to your question as well as the fragmentation aspect, which you touched on at the end. Um, in terms of the substantive aspect, yes, of course, we picked these just for the purpose of the report. Yes, I would envisage, if this instrument were to be realized, that it would extend to things like children as offenders and child detainees. I don't think it would necessarily need to deal with children as refugees, since there is a huge body of law separately that deals with that. Um, but I think that that's a question that really turns on political will. You start with the things that are common ground, like killing and sexual violence, and then I think you expand outwards from there. In terms of your uh, later point, which seemed to go towards the concern about fragmentation, we already have that in lots of areas of international law. Just think about the number of human rights instruments that there are that contain very, very similar provisions, and some are regional, some are universal, some are domestic even, and they, the constitutions still contain essentially the same right. And, and that's something that the system can manage, and the reason the system can manage it is because you have an adjudicative body that interprets the authorities under those different instruments in a way which is cohesive and makes sense according to legal reasoning. And so I would anticipate that that would be the solution to that problem, which I, ex I completely accept is a real one. Um, the, the fact that these violations are targetable under this instrument or this approach doesn't mean that other collateral or related issues aren't also targetable and identifiable under other bodies of law. But what it's doing is it's singling out what I think we intuitively think of as a unique harm in the form of a unique legal violation. There's a reason why Boko Haram's seizure of these girls um, attracted so much uh, human attention. Uh, th there's a reason why in 2013 when Joseph Kony was singled out for YouTube condemnation, a billion people said it's self-evident that a guy like this should be brought to justice. But in fact, we have bodies of law which 
don't talk about children as the focal point. You know, there are war crimes, and some of those war crimes involve children. There are crimes against humanity, and some of those crimes against humanity involve children. There's genocide, and some of that genocide affects children. So I think this uh, proposal is to actually single out this particularly vulnerable group as being subject to a whole set of unique um, uh, depredations, and then to say that they ought to be capable of invoking various kinds of remedies and uh, invoking various kinds of protections. And part of it is to just achieve a very high degree of consensus. People may disagree about some of these issues on the margin, uh, but this is at the core of the violation. Who in the world is going to defend, you know, enslaving and raping 12-year-old children and making them kill each other? If you have accepted that as legitimate, you've essentially lost your humanity a long time ago. When Save the Children was uh, founded uh, 100 years ago, the uh, founder, Eglinton Jeb, said that the only international language that people could understand is the cry of a child. And that suggested that uh, children's rights and discussion of violation of children was uppermost in any international discussion uh, about um, uh, conflicts or about emergencies. In actual fact, if you look back on the last 50 years and the civil rights struggles or human rights struggles of the last 50 years, black civil rights in America, anti-apartheid mainly in Africa, gender equality, rights for disabled people, rights for lesbian gay uh, people. Uh, it, it actually strikes me that, that children, children's rights have been neglected. We have the Convention for the Rights of the, the Children. We have uh, uh, statements, obviously, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But I, I think when you look at some of the um, policies that then flow from this, uh, children's rights uh, in conflict zones have actually been uh, neglected quite um, uh, so, so, so tragically and dramatically. So when it comes to humanitarian aid, for example, only 2% of humanitarian aid will go to children's uh, education, and there are many more instances of that. So I would say as far as this question that um, Shahid raised, very important, where is the political will? Can there be political will found? To make big changes, particularly can you reopen issues that some people think were closed when you had the Convention of the Rights of the Child? I think it is absolutely essential that there is a, a, a pressure that comes specifically about the rights of uh, ch ch children. Indeed, I, I think particularly for girls and girls' education, you could argue uh, that this is the civil rights struggle of our, our generation, uh, and it's got to be it's got to be won. So I, I, I think the emphasis on children's rights is both um, justifiable, but it's also politically necessary if we're going to see this kind of changes that I think any sensible person uh, who has a common decency would want would want to happen. Um. Uh, I would also like uh, to talk, uh, ask about this supplementary recommendation. I think that was very, very striking that suddenly we want to bring uh, all of these uh, pieces into a, a single uh, instrument, but maybe for, for, for different reasons. First, in terms of rat rat um, ratification, again, by states, I don't know what will be the will uh, like at this, at this point, uh, but then also because of um, uh, norms of uh, customary law, which are not are not typified, and then if we want to typify them now, would that mean that those states that have not ratified, um, you know what I mean, those customary law are are there because of custom, not because they are in a in a treaty. So that could entail some challenges in terms of those states who have ratified the new customary law typified. And then also because it raises to me the question of non-state actors when, when the states, let's say, are try to, to get away from anything that deals with that and the work of Geneva Call and the problems they have had. Uh, so I would like you to hear a bit more, please, about this. Thank you. So, so let me begin with your last point first about non-state armed actors. And I think it's something which is often forgotten, which is that the Geneva Conventions apply 
to non-state actors. Common Article 3 binds them. It's uncontroversial as a matter of international law that non-state armed actors are bound by certain norms of international humanitarian law. We can debate about why that's so, but the actual conclusion is not something that's credibly contestable. And so once you've accepted that, that they, there are these norms that bind armed non-state groups, what we're doing is simply suggesting that they're put into a document. They already exist in both the Fourth Geneva Convention and Additional Protocol 2. Um, in terms of the will of those groups, that is why it would be necessary to have a pledge process, as I indicated. Obviously, it's difficult to impose certain kinds of obligations on them without their involvement in terms of practical effect. One could do it as a substantive matter, but if you actually want their engagement, then it would be necessary to have their involvement. Um, but that's why I think that the work of Geneva Call is interesting, because there are groups that are signing up. You can see them on their website, see which of the deeds of commitment they've signed up to. And as you might know, there is a specific deed of commitment for the protection of children in armed conflict, and 26 groups have signed it. And so I think it's a difficult issue, but it's about trying to involve these stakeholders, because that's what they are in this process. I think there's also a concern about um, legitimizing them um, in terms of the comment that we heard from some of the people that we consulted that you might get pushback on the single instrument because states wouldn't want to be seen to be treating armed non-state groups essentially as legitimate entities under international law. But again, that's something that international law has already addressed by virtue of the fact that instruments like the Fourth Geneva Convention, Additional Protocol 2, do extend to them. Those documents contain specific provisions which say that there's no recognition that's being conferred on those entities, even though they are regarded as bound by the norms in question. So there are legal answers to the question of imposing norms on those groups and on whether or not that counts as some form of legitimizing treatment. Um, the earlier questions that you raised, I think, are ones that we've covered in some of the discussion already, apart from the issue of customary international law. Um, that is a difficult issue. My first response to it would be to say as a reminder that a lot of the norms that are in the Red Cross's study on customary international law do have a treaty basis. So it's not necessary to say that norm A is only a norm in customary international law and therefore its embodiment in a new treaty would somehow diminish the significance of it because it has a life in instruments. And it's more a question of the degree and the scope of the provisions rather than whether or not they exist in the first place. So I think it is a problem, but I think it's less of a problem in the detail of the instrument than might be thought at a general level of a discussion of this nature. Um, I've had a go at drafting this instrument, and when you look at the overlap between the treaty provisions and customary international law, that's actually one of the less difficult issues because you are able to say that the provision in question has a treaty provision as its derivative rather than a norm of customary international law. So I would expect that that set of rules would stay as they are, if necessary. Um, I think you ask an important question about ratification strategy. Um, and generally speaking, uh, there have been two approaches to ratification of human rights instruments. One is to, to have a broad instrument, like the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, or the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and try to get lots of countries to join all the provisions. Uh, the problem with that is that if a country has an objection to one provision, they might not join. That explains, for example, why the United States didn't, is the only country that hasn't ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and it turns out, for example, it says that children are uh, eight, defined as uh, below 18. Uh, when I was in the US government, it turned out that a lot of our American military recruiting is of high school students 
who graduate from high school when they're 17. And um, if they couldn't recruit them, uh, they would lose half of the volunteer forces in what is an all-volunteer army. So um, what we did instead in the Clinton administration was when there were two optional protocols, which uh, he'd mentioned, one on worst forms of child labor and on children in armed conflict, uh, we proposed that the United States ratify those two specialized protocols which focused on the, the worst forms of child abuse. And um, there was a very uh, important moment where the Joint Chiefs of Staff considered this question, and their objection was, again, if we assign this, we won't be able to enlist high school graduates into our armed forces. So we asked them to identify how many students would actually be affected. Because you know many kids graduate from high school when they're after 17, basic training is more six months. And it turned out it was less than 2,000. So we then made the case to them, we are on the side of Joseph Coney and um, the Lord's Resistance Army because of 2,000 kids who will turn 18 in three months. So why don't we just do an administrative fix whereby those will be kept out until they turn 18 and then we can ratify the, um, the optional protocol on children in armed conflict. But then when we took this to the um, uh, human rights community, a lot of people were offended that the United States would ratify this optional protocol without having ratified the convention in chief. And I remember in particular the French delegate said to me, we don't like when you take an a la carte approach to uh, human rights treaties. And I said, well, I noticed that when you eat a la carte, you tend to go to the restaurant more often and get used to it. <laughs> and if you get used to it, then it might be that in a few years' time it won't be such a big deal to ratify the convention in chief. And I think that that's exactly what's been happening. So I think as a ratification strategy, uh, this is a good way in to identify the worst forms of abuse, in particular because the focus is on armed groups. Governments can endorse this as a way of holding armed groups to a certain level of conduct, and then of course they have to abstain from that conduct themselves. And so I think it's a good way to create a race to the top as opposed to what sometimes happens, which is a race to the bottom. Okay, I've got three people on the queue, so I will just name you and then maybe we could have the panel take the questions they would like. So I have Deborah, Nikki, and Melina. Okay, then Nikki and Melina. Thank you, uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I very much look forward to reading the report and, and being able to engage with the content in more depth. Um, I wanted to ask a couple questions that take a step back and are a little bit bigger picture, um, pr precisely because I haven't yet read the, the findings, um, but also because of the, the nature of the conversation we're having, I think makes clear that there are a lot of existing legal protections, or at least in principle, a lot of norms um, and instruments out there. And so at the risk of, of sounding like the still skeptical uh, listener after uh, Professor Coe's remarks about the skeptical questions, did the, the panel and did this inquiry and do each of you individually um, grapple with the question of how uh, worthwhile in reinforcing or how, how effective it will be to reinforce the legal framework when there really is a continued rampant flouting of the law, not just with respect to children in conflict, but with respect to the violations of the rights of civilians around the world, and we see ample examples. So that's the first of my two-part question. One is really about assessing the efficacy of investing energy and resources in reinforcing, consolidating, or revamping that legal framework when, as, as I think you acknowledged yourself um, in the beginning, the enforcement of that legal framework is so deficient. And the second is, I guess, again, uh, in, this, in this vein of being skeptical and somewhat provocative, to ask, um, given the prominent role of the US and the UK and people from former members of government and others in this panel, and, and given the role of the US and the UK, in global policy, in ongoing conflicts, in the sale of weapons um, that are used to perpetrate many of these abuses, uh, to what extent do you address the duty of those Western powers and those states 
in the continual perpetration of uh, abuses against children and their role not just in terms of their active engagement in conflict, but as um, the sellers of uh, and enablers of that conflict. Thank you. Melina. Hi there. Thank you very much. And so my question is a bit more about um, institutional um, capacities. So I, my, my plain question is, do you think, does your organization and the work that you have been discussing today um, work to tackle the problem at an institutional level where bodies such as UN keeping that, you know, bodies like the UN that are supposed to keep peace, like the keeping uh, the missions, um, have issues internally where, for example, I was just talking to a UN lawyer who stated that different parts of the peacekeeping missions have different definitions of children and of um, consent and uh, regarding sexual intercourse. And therefore, um, do you think that the work that you're doing will sort of help to solve these, these problems at institutional levels? Thank you. Yeah, the first one. Um, so I'm going to answer the first part of your two-part question. And I'm hoping Harold and Gordon are <coughs> ready with answers to the second part of your two-part question. Um, it's a chicken and egg, isn't it? Because if you throw your hands up in the air and say, it's all terrible, nothing's going to make a difference, you do nothing. And if you do something, you are left with the plague in doubt, well, what difference does it make? And of those two options, I think I'd always rather do something and doubt whether it would make a difference than not do it at all. So I completely agree. I mean, I, I share your skepticism, having led and written this document about whether or not the process of collection and codification and consolidation will lead to a change. But I don't see what other alternative we have as lawyers we have to at least give law the best option that it has of being effective. And I think it's a really difficult issue to expect compliance by people who are not lawyers in a very technical area when the law is such a mess for us to understand and grapple with. So it seems to me that the first thing to do is to try and straighten it out, clarify it. Whether it will make a difference, your guess is as good as mine, but I think it's much better to have done it and regret the fact that hours were spent doing it than to not do it at all. Um, obviously, Gordon can answer for the United Kingdom. Uh, you know, the United States government does not have a policy of targeting or killing children. Uh, our military are trained in the Geneva Conventions and have rigorous internal procedures about not targeting civilians. Um, obviously, the question is about the sale of indiscriminate weapons. And, you know, so for example, the United States should ratify the Landmines Convention. There's no doubt in my mind. The United States should not um, uh, support the use of unexploded ordnance. The United States should not use cluster munitions. The United States should not. Uh, endorse um, autonomous robot systems, which do not have a capacity to distinguish between civilians and military targets. So I do think that there is, uh, even apart from U.S. targeting practices, U.S. sale and procurement practices have to be uh, modified um, to make sure that they don't have the net result of breaching what I think is a core uh, internal norm. And I think that um, uh, there's a very high degree of sensitivity about this issue in the U.S. government. Look, look at even, even Donald Trump um, wanted to do something in response to Syrian children being uh, killed with chemical weapons. Now, it doesn't extend to his wanting to admit Syrian children to the United States under the travel ban. So there's, there's a lack of... Uh, there's a lack of consistency there in his awareness, but that's not surprising. Yeah, I, I think one of your arguments 
that um, perhaps the um, the narrowness uh, of of the the group you're, you're suggesting who did this, I, I I don't think that's strictly right. When we started, we had um, what was called the Global Citizenship Commission, and it is out of this that the special um, investigation has been done by, by Shahid, and it was representative of every continent. Uh, we had people from uh, poor countries as well as rich countries, the developed world, the developing world, uh, China, India, you know, they, they, they were all part of this co co commission, and the commission made a number of recommendations about children's rights. Uh, Shahid has been the person who's taken it forward. So. Um, yes, uh, you know, you, you, you always uh, want to be far more inclusive in a global discussion. I, I, think, I, think, I think, secondly, um, your point about um, essentially hypocrisy, <laughs> about uh, we, we tried over, over the period we were, we were in, in government, and I'm not sort of claiming uh, a huge, uh, great successes, but, you know, we did, uh, we did uh, outlaw... Uh, landmines, cluster bombs, we did take action in relation to chemical weapons, we did have far stricter rules on, on, on arms sales. Um, and I'm afraid progress in these areas is not dramatic, it's, it's, it's inch, inch by, by, by inch. Uh, but I wouldn't like you to think that we've neglected uh, some, of, some of these issues and don't recognize them to be important. I think the problem we've got is because of the number, the multiplicity of conflicts now, because of the um, veto power in the Security Council and the in, its inability to, 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 to act because of the smaller, well, because of the numbers who did not sign the International Criminal uh, Court, um, uh, we, 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 you know, we have not done uh, all that we, we want to do and there is huge um, progress got to be made and I, I just have got to go back to what Shahid said, I mean, if we, if we hold our hands up and say it's not possible uh, because we failed in the past and give up, uh, then the world will certainly be a far worse uh, place. And if the message goes out that we have lost um, interest in some of these issues because we think we will never never succeed, uh, then we are making it possible for the next generation to neglect many of these, uh, the, 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 these, these issues. And I think, as I said at the beginning, the, the, the message, the message you, you send out, uh, sometimes you think you're not, it's not being heard. But as I'm, I pointed out in the Nigerian case, it, it, it was was being it was being heard. I mean, I too uh, had the good fortune to um, to know um, Nelson uh, Mandela, and I met him not so long after he came out of prison. And of course, he came to Britain on a number of occasions, and I visited him in South Africa and at his home. And he said um, at one point uh, after he'd retired as president, he said, "I have climbed one mountain, which is uh, the um, end of apartheid." Uh, I I must now climb a second mountain, and that is uh, that we must uh, give every child in the world the best opportunity possible. And he said that he was devoting the rest of his, uh, his life uh, to securing proper rights uh, for, for, for children. And in fact, the Nelson Mandela Foundation uh, that was created was to build hospitals and schools uh, for uh, children in, in, in South Africa, but in other parts of Africa uh, as well. I just say this as a story. He came to London late in his life to celebrate his 90th birthday, and the purpose of that was to raise money for his his foundation for 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 for, for, for children. And he auctioned a lot of his own possessions uh, to to do so. So, when when people like Mandela take up the cause, it can make a difference. But when individuals are tweeting, when they're on Facebook, when they're talking to people on the internet, and again, I just repeat, don't underestimate the difference that can be made. Want to take that third? I'll, I'll just the question about institutional difference. I, I would hope so. I would hope that this would have a trickle down effect from, you know, the, the big level that we've been debating and discussing things on, to to other levels. I wasn't sure though whether your question was about peacekeeping operations and the conduct of the peacekeeping operations themselves. That's actually one of the specific areas that we've not considered, and we've not considered it for the reason that the areas that we focused on are states, non-state armed groups, and essentially victims. There are obviously other relevant institutional players in this system, and I think you're alluding to the instances where there have been offenses potentially allegedly committed 
by the peacekeepers, but that's something that we've expressly not addressed because it raises a whole different set of issues. So we have time to take a few more questions. Um, I see Anji and then I see Deirdre. Okay, that's four questions. I mean, I've got you all in the queue now. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, thanks for this presentation. It's a little hard to say if this question is answered in the report since I haven't seen it, but I'm curious about how the report and the recommendations address the issue of gender and sort of the different violations, if you have the same violation but the different impacts it could have on a boy or a girl child, for instance, like if a girl is raped, she runs the risk of being pregnant, this doesn't happen to a boy, denial of humanitarian access, that sort of thing, and just, just looking at um, how, how, that's, how that's treated in the report and recommendations. Deirdre. I'm gonna preface this with IHL isn't really what I would consider my specialty area, but I have more of a substantive question. I'm curious to know how um, you're addressing reconciling the Geneva distinction between competence and non-competence um, relevant to child soldiers. So the second grave violation, killing and maiming of children, is articulated um, around the principles of distinction and proportionality. Um, but when the children are actively the people who are like participating in the hostilities themselves, um, that seems problematic legally to me. Michaela. Thank you all for um, presenting what is such a hopeful and inspiring human rights project in what is um, certainly a worrying time for the human rights field. Um, and I, I really admire the commitment to this issue. Um, I, w I wanted to um, ask something um, based on what Professor Coe said about the um, special status that human that um, children enjoy in the in the eyes of the law, um, you allu allu alluded to the fact that children are seen as almost favourites in the eyes of the law. Um, but also, as we know, one of the first things we learn of in family law is um, the limited legal capacity um, of of children, um, especially before adjudicative bodies, and. Um, I wanted to ask how that plays out in um, in the supplementary recommendation, especially um, and particularly given the um, potential absence of legal guardians um, in the context of children who um, find themselves in conflict-ridden countries. Thank you. Thank you. And I know there was a fourth hand in the back. Okay, Katie. Thank you also for your time. Um, I have a question about the voice of children in this process. Um, so I wanted to ask whether you interviewed any children in undertaking this inquiry. Um, and I understand it was a legal review and obviously there's complexities in talking to children about um, international law. But um, I'm just curious as to whether you spoke to any children about the protections that they need um, in order to inform your inquiry about the, exact, the um, gaps in the existing framework. Okay, we have about 10 minutes to try to respond to those questions as, as well as we'd like to. Shahid, would you like to start? I'll start. Um, I'll go backwards. No, we didn't consult with any children. Uh, I don't think my children count for these purposes. <laughs> they, they were consulted um, <laughs> on quite a few issues. Um, but no, we didn't. Uh, I, and I think you answered your question about the fact that this was a legal uh, inquiry, so we didn't do that sort of factual information gathering. But I think it would be an important part of this process if it was to go forward to have their involvement in in this. Um, your question about the capacity in which uh, children act and the role of guardianship, um, yes, of course, it's a very good practical point about the fact that there may often be an absence of guardians given the context that we're talking about. I would anticipate that in that sort of situation there would be recourse as there often is in many domestic systems to the appointment of a guardian to represent somebody and that, that they would have access to that form of assistance um, where they didn't have a personal parent or other guardian that could assist them. Um, the issue of uh, children that directly participate in hostilities is a very, very difficult one. Um, can I reassure you that 
Hanif and I have written a chapter which is about 70 pages, Hanif, on this topic, and that is one of the most difficult aspects that we've grappled with. Uh, I won't do it justice if I try to summarize it, but yes, we, we have certainly addressed it and taken it into account, and we've made proposals for how the relevant provisions in the additional protocols in particular should be reconciled um, and how the inconsistencies between humanitarian law and criminal law should be treated as well. And then the final question on gender, um, that was quite a difficult one actually for us in the sexual violence chapter because um, the form in which the grave violations are drafted, it, it focuses very much on sexual violence and ultimately I took my lead from that, but we have covered gender-based violence as a definition. We've set out the fact that it is far greater in terms of its scope than pure sexual violence. We've indicated the scope of our own inquiry by reference to that gender-based violence definition to make clear what we are and are not dealing with. Um, but there's actually uh, a lot of work that's being done on the fact that boys are victims of sexual violence um, often to a quite considerable degree and that their problems are not discussed in the literature. So it is a concern that we were alive to, but we didn't, partly for limitations of time and space, go through it in detail. Um, <clears throat> some of the issues with regard to children who are participating in armed conflict is technological. So when I first went to Afghanistan as, as legal advisor of the State Department. We went to a military prison and interviewed uh, detainees. And a group of them came up to us and said, you know, um, a lot of these people are children. And uh, we we're in a room like this. And I said, which ones are the children? Namely, under the age of 18. And they were pointing to a large group of six foot guys um, and um, so we said, Are, can you prove that you're under the age of 18? And they said, no, they couldn't. And we went to the authorities who were holding them and they said, we don't think that there are children. We then went back to the embassy and discussed this with the embassy staff and they said, uh, we have a bone scanner, which is actually able to authoritatively determine how old someone is. And they brought the bone scanner back to the prison ran it through and sure enough, 30 of these six foot guys were in fact 16 years old. Now, th then the question goes, what do you do with these uh, people? If you want to remove them from a military setting, you should move them somewhere where they're not gathered together. I mean, we've all read The Lord of the Flies and uh, you, you never know to what extent certain kinds of behaviors are replicated which is one reason why the best approach is to try to remove someone from the wartime setting and send them somewhere else. And we went through this in particular with Omar Cotter, who is a Canadian who is on Guantanamo. Um, it turned out that there was great resistance to releasing him because although he was underage, when he threw an IED, uh, some soldiers were killed, so the families of the soldiers didn't want him to be um, released. But after a fairly extensive discussion with the Canadian government, the decision was made that he would be given credit for time served on Guantanamo, moved to Canada, and put into a rehabilitative setting, um, which would finish out his term. And the notion that he was still in custody sort of calmed the family. He then moved to Canada served in a, non in a rehabilitative setting for about a year and a half, was released, and recently got married, and as far as I know, is doing quite well. So a lot of this is some of the many issues that you face with regard to juvenile offenders in, in crime being carried out in, a, in a, a wartime setting. Can I say, because this is my, my, my last and our last contribution to this, uh, I want to thank you all for being here this, this afternoon because it's a very important uh, discussion for us to hear your views and to, and, and to hear your, the questions that you have, which we'll consider uh, very, very, very carefully as we try to win support for this um, document. The, the three points that, uh, that were asked about, uh, you know, we did, when we did the Citizenship Commission, uh, try to consult children and, and, and young people. So. 
uh, in the original document, there was some of that. I think when you're talking about the voices of children, I, I think uh, what Shahid referred to, um, the, uh, the protocol under the Convention of the Rights of the Children, uh, three, the communications protocol, uh, has got real potential. Uh, it, it allows an individual child to make a case um, against uh, the government and against uh, an, an abuse and violation uh, right through to the United Nations, uh, but uh, it's never been used. Uh, and although it is in existence, it has never been used. And I've been looking myself for uh, the chance to, for a test case on that so that we, we could actually uh, give a voice uh, to children who've been affected and, and go, of course, beyond national governments which, um, where, where they fail to act on behalf of the children. And I think then more generally, and this is one of the themes, I think, of the next decade, the voices of young people and, and, and how, they are, how they are heard. And it's not just a theme about children and young people in conflict, it's a more general theme. I mean, we saw only a few days ago uh, the March um, uh, for Your Lives, uh, the children's, uh, school children's uh, march uh, in Washington and other cities. If you go around the world, I think it's really interesting to note that there's quite a lot of other uh, youth and uh, children's uh, movements that are having some impact uh, and the voices of children, uh, and particularly girls when it comes to education and, and, and issues like that, have got to be heard because that's where the discrimination is, is greatest. But you've got the um, anti-child marriage movement in Bangladesh uh, where they've created uh, child marriage-free zones. You've got the global march against child labor involving young uh, uh, children and protesting for the, for, for the rights. <laughs> Uh, you have in Africa similar uh, movements on behalf of young people, some of which arose because of the Nigerian uh, kidnapping. So uh, the voices of young people, I think, are going to be an important um, element in the, um, in the next stage of uh, change. Uh, and I think uh, we've got to listen, uh, but also they are going to force us to listen if we don't, uh, if we don't listen. Well, I'd like to thank the panelists once more. Um, this was an incredibly rich conversation, and I'd like to invite Andrew to give remarks, and then we'll, we'll close. So I have the uh, unenviable task of um, summarizing all the contributions we've just heard, um, but I'll give it a go. We um, got a bit of background and context um, at the start by Meg and Gordon basically said that this um, initiative was born in NYU, um, not only because Gordon and Shahid met at an NYU event in Barcelona, but also because John Sexton and Gordon had set up the Global Citizenship Commission, which a couple of years ago reported to the UN on the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And one of the key findings of that commission was that um, although the rights of children were not explicitly addressed in the declaration, they were subsequently have come to be recognized um, and the commission advanced a number of recommendations um, designed to realize the rights of children in the 21st century and one of them was around this idea of accountability potentially through a new mechanism and this is one that the inquiry is taking forward uh, in the context of armed conflict meg then put into context i think the urgency of this initiative um, by referring to this week's chemical attack um, in syria now, there's a recent uh, Save the Children report that I thought had pretty shocking statistics, and it found that one in six children in the world now live in a conflict zone. So that's 357 million, and that's up from 200 million in the early 90s. And by many metrics, particularly focusing on the work of the Special Representative in Children in Armed Conflict, children are now more at risk of their rights being violated in conflict than at any time in the last 20 years. We heard, um, from Gordon that he initially called for the inquiry at the 20th anniversary of Grasha Michelle's report in this area, which highlighted gaps in the protection of children in armed conflict um, and led to the creation of the UN mechanism. Um, and, and as Shahid said, 20 years on, the landscape has changed dramatically and in some ways this makes this exercise uh, even more challenging. We've had interstate conflicts, conflicts between nations, largely are increasingly replaced by intra-state wars between or involving non-state actors. We've had battles that increasingly been brought into civilian settings um, and advances in technology we heard have had a kind of double-edged uh, uh, sword. They've been used both to monitor and verify rights violations, 
but they've also been used uh, to recruit and indoctrinate children. So that means the nature of the task is in many ways much harder than it was 20 years ago. Shahid set out the scope um, of the inquiry uh, and said that it's very much focused on the six grave violations developed by the UN and um, because there's already political consensus around those issues. Now this means that there are a number of related issues that are not within the remit of the inquiry, including detention, including refugees, uh, and including peacekeeping. So the report, as I've heard, sets out uh, a number of uh, recommendations across um, the six areas. Uh, and as Harold showed, it's an incredibly detailed and comprehensive piece of work that took a number of the people we consulted, not including Harold, but a number of the external bodies, quite some time to read it. Um, <laughs> due, due to slide, actually potentially even longer than it took for Shahid and her brilliant team uh, to write it. Um, but in addition to uh, the detailed um, recommendations and analysis uh, across these six areas, there was also one overarching um, supplemental uh, recommendation, and that's the creation of a single instrument um, governing children armed conflict, which should be monitored uh, and enforced by a single adjudicative body. Now, the report acknowledges throughout that we have an issue, and in many ways the fundamental issue is a lack of political will. Um, but it does make a very compelling case that the process of consolidating and in certain cases strengthening the legal framework can focus the attention of the international community on this issue and potentially lead to the enhanced protection. Um, Professor Cole began by, by raising three questions, which is, do we need another report? Uh, will it accomplish anything? Um, and will we have anywhere to go afterwards? And fortunately, he answered each of those, yes. Um, this, in many ways, uh, Professor Cole's contribution is rooted in his recent work in his recent Washburn Law Journal article entitled The Trump Administration and International Law, which is the precursor for a book that I believe will be out in the fall. Um, and in this article, he makes a very positive vision um, of the role that international can play during the Trump uh, administration. Um, he gives us, as one example of this, um, the legal challenges to the Trump administration's Muslim ban. Um, and we very much hope that the inquiry can be another example of the power of international law which Professor Cole described as a principled and passionate endeavour um, where we can hopefully um, affect change. Professor Cole also says something else that was very interesting, that children are the favourites of the law. Uh, and although if you look at what's happening in Syria and Yemen and elsewhere, it might not always seem like that, I think that this is very much the rationale of the inquiry, which is that if states can agree to anything at all in this climate, it is to protect the world's most vulnerable in conflict. And in undertaking this historical review of the protection of children in conflict, and we have a chapter setting out the history, um, protections for children in war uh, have proved to be the area most likely and most conducive to international cooperation, but also of a means for transforming international relations between, between countries. And we hope that that will be the case in 2018. I want to thank you all for your um, very constructive and thoughtful uh, insights and questions, which I've taken a note of and we'll definitely go back and, and look through as we're finalising the report. Um, we had a number of questions and a lot of interest on the supplementary recommendation for a new instrument. Um, we had a question about the issues don't have fences, so why are you erecting fences here? Um, we had questions about the political will for a new instrument, um, how to deal with non-state actors, why put resources into consolidation when we have deficiencies by our own admission and enforcement, the role of the West um, in some of these violations, certain institutional issues at the UN um, where different peacekeeping bodies have different definitions, the treatment of gender, um, and how we deal with the special status of, of children. So thank you very much for, for coming and, and thank you for, for those questions. Um, and just to conclude, uh, as Professor Cole said, this is the beginning and not the end. There's already been a remarkable amount of work done by Shahid uh, and the legal panel, and we've also liaised with a number of external bodies, so academics, um, lawyers, practitioners, um, and NGOs, and taken into account their, their input. The report we expect will be published in September, um, and we very much hope you all look out for it. Um, and finally, I'd just like to, to end by thanking the Centre for Human Rights and Global Justice, for Meg, 
uh, for Deborah, particularly, and Lauren, who have both helped make this possible, and for Catalyst, who have supported the event. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.